I get to introduce you to my favorite student. She gets everything right. It's amazing. And Serky. Think about it. Figure it out. Jimmy missed out on the joke because he's not paying attention. Okay, here we go. Ancient times, some Greek philosophers thought that. What did you put there? Yeah. I totally agree with that, but that's too much writing for me. I, I've told you I tend to abbreve. I thought about it. I said, thought that you, and if you wrote that, you're fine, could divide. There's my abbreviation for divide, division sign. Matter into smallest chunk. Jimmy, you're not just writing this down, are you? I'm putting an answer key online. As I said several times, the foolish thing would be to just copy this out right now. That's not learning. So put your pencil down. You're going to do this at your, on your own at home. But you'll have an answer key to check and see if you're doing it right. Uh, what did they name the smallest piece of matter? Atomos. From which we get the word? Yep. But Aristotle thought that, and he was a very influential scientist, philosopher at the time. What did he think that everything was made up of? Okay. Okay. Everything was earth, air, water, fire. You still hear that expression nowadays. You see it in fantasy movies or sci-fi or whatever. It's still that influential even though it's wrong. It's not a bad idea. And then he would say, for example, uh, when you burn a log, what does the log turn into? Air, because that's the smoke. So he says, see, it's... I'm good with this. And everything was made up of different combinations of it. Yeah. Wrong. Alchemists were trying to turn what into what? Lead into gold. By the way, I can't turn the touch screen off on this machine, so you have to bear with me. I'm a lefty, and I always touch the screen as I write, so I'm going to try and learn how to write better. But if you see the screen shake every so often, I apologize. We get to modern times. I'll probably ask you some of this next bit on your test. So John Dalton, what were the four points of his theory? You remember? Yep. All matter is made of small particles called Okay. All matter is made of particles, small particles. And he called them atoms. He took the old Greek word. That he was correct on. He just didn't know that there were even smaller things that made up atoms. So, second thing, what did he say? Petco. Cannot be created, destroyed, or divided. Uh, those last two are no longer technically right. So when Einstein came along in the atomic age, that's why we call it the atomic age. You can hear the word atom in there. We learned how to split the atom. That's what a nuclear bomb is. And Einstein, in his famous equation, E equals mc squared, he said, oh, by the way, all matter is energy and can be turned into that. One of the reasons nuclear bombs give off so much energy is a tiny, tiny amount of matter is converted to energy, so some atoms are actually destroyed. Uh, C, uh, third, uh, third thing. This is good. Sarah. All atoms of the same element are identical in mass and size, but are different in mass and size from okay. atoms All atoms of same element are identical. 
this, this, this is one of the key ideas. This was a revolutionary thought. People hadn't realized that. But it turns out any gold atom anywhere in the universe will look like any other gold atom anywhere in the universe. Okay. Fourth thing. Fourth thing. Nick, what'd you put? And again, as always, I'm going to try and shorten this in a brief. So compounds are made up of, and I said uh, proportions of atoms. And this is what you're going to start to learn over the next little while. You'll understand why it's H2O. You'll understand why it's NaCl. You'll understand why it's, uh, trying to do some in my head here, uh, MgCl2 and think you, you understand why you need one of one, two of another, or three of another, and how they all fit together. This one was kind of vague. Why is it impossible to turn lead into gold? Sure, Julia. Yeah, why? Okay, so here's the magic answer. I'm not going to ask you this on a test, but this is what we're going to talk about in the next chapter. It turns out. Lead has more protons than gold. And it turns out, if you want to describe what an atom is, it's the number of protons. If you've got one proton, it's a hydrogen atom. If you've got two protons, it's a helium atom. If you've got three protons, it's a lithium atom. Everybody look up, look behind you. Ready, ready, ready? You've got one proton, it's a hydrogen atom. If you've got two protons, it's a helium atom. If you've got three protons, it's a lithium atom. Four protons is beryllium. This is how you read the periodic table, and this is what it's telling you. It's telling you how many protons make up that atom. So as you get to five protons, it's boron. Six protons is carbon. If you get to 41 protons, that's niobium. I have no idea what, which one that is or where it's used, but okay. This is how the periodic table is defined. It's all based on the number of protons an atom has. Neutrons change a little bit, electrons move around a little bit, but protons define what an atom is. Dalton's model of an atom resembled a what? Here's what I said, I think, with you folks. Solid all the way through, and you couldn't break it up. Uh, I think the textbook might have said a billiard ball, but I don't know how many of you play pool. I figure more of you done bowling. J.J. Thompson came along. He discovered negatively charged particles called... Yeah. E negative, that's our abbreviation for electrons. P little plus is our abbreviation for protons. And little zero is our abbreviation for neutrons. We'll use those. And he proposed that atoms were made of... charged particles. Now we're getting closer. His model of an atom remembered, uh, resembled, re remembered, resembled, resembled what? We call it the plum pudding model. If you say chocolate chip muffin, I'll be good with that, or chocolate chip cookie or something. And again, the idea is the dough is this positive stuff. He didn't know what it was, but the chocolate chips, those are the electrons. The electrons have always been easier to spot because they're, we now know, on the outer part of an atom. He didn't know that at the time. He just knew that I'm seeing these things. Describe Rutherford's famous experiment. So, what he did is he fired alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil. And Almost all went straight through. From that, what can we conclude? If almost all of them went straight through, what was his conclusion about the makeup of an atom? Remember? So the fact that all of them went through, what did that allow us to conclude? You're right, that's the second part I'm going to mention, by the way. But what did this first part already allow him to conclude? Quentin? That's the second part that only a few bounced off. But the fact that most of them went through, this is so obvious it's tricky to realize. Yeah. There's a lot of space. Ah, 
atom is mostly empty space. That was his first. Oh, they're not bowling balls. They're mostly empty space. Remember that this is going back to where Dalton has taken us. Okay, they're mostly empty space. Now, the second thing that happened, Javin, you're right. Some very few rebounded. Sometimes straight back, sometimes at an angle. I showed you a video of the Rutherford experiment. You missed out on it, Dylan, sorry. What did that allow him to conclude? Really, really small. So something really small. I'm going to say, it's. I can't use the word heavy because nucleuses are really, really light. But for their size, they're heavy. And we have a word for that. We call it dense. Bear with me. We're going to keep going until we get interrupted. Um, this was the... What was the really small, really dense thing in the middle? Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully you're also hearing uh, words that have now become common. This is where the word nuclear come from. The nuclear age started when we suddenly realized, oh, there's something smaller than atoms. There's a nucleus in there. We can split the nucleus. When we can break it apart, that's splitting the atom. That's the atomic age. And then we turn the page. Rutherford discovered the... Oh, nucleus, which was a tiny, dense, and he also knew it was positively charged. He didn't know that the reason it was positively charged was because the protons were there, but he just knew it was positively charged. He didn't know about protons yet or neutrons yet. Center of the atom. He later discovered that the nucleus contains two types of particles. What do we say is inside the nucleus? Yep. The really tough ones to discover were the neutrons. We usually use charged objects to detect other charged objects, but because neutrons have no charge, they didn't react with our normal bank of experiments. It took some real cleverness. Which ones are positively charged? Okay, P plus. Which ones have no charge? Neutrons. Then I have draw a m diagram of his model of the atom. So Rutherford believed the atom looked like this. There was the nucleus, and there were protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. And then he just figured that the electrons were kind of scattered kind of willy-nilly all over the place. He didn't yet realize that the electrons also have a structure. So far, so good. Hopefully, 99% of this is review or just clarifying what we've done already. Niels Bohr came along, and he showed that the electrons surround the nucleus in, I guarantee this is going to be a word on your test, shells. I'll even write it in red so it stands out. So here is a diagram of an atom as we understand it today. This is still a model. This is still wrong, but it's less wrong than everything we've done so far. And it's less wrong enough that we'll call it mostly right. So we now say we have protons and neutrons in the middle. But now we know that there are shells. And you can keep going out, keep going out. You'll learn in the next chapter that the innermost shell can only hold two electrons. You'll learn in the next chapter that the second shell can only hold eight electrons. And it's the fact that each of these shells can only hold certain amounts that starts to explain why things have to combine in the ratios that they do. That's going to start to explain why H2O works and not H3O or H1O. So, symbol P plus, N zero, E minus, relative mass one. What did I say it was? 1836 and then 1837 for the neutron. Electric charge, positive one, zero, negative one. And then location, 
this might be, in fact, I'll even tell you, I'm gonna ask you to fill in this chart, except I don't think I'm gonna freak out about the relative mass, but absolutely symbol, charge, and location, you're gonna get that chart on your test. Where is the proton located in an atom? What about the neutron? What about the electron? Yep. How can a charge on an atom be zero if it contains charged particles? So on that table behind you, I said beryllium, which is the fourth one, has four protons. It's got a charge of zero, though. If it has four protons, how can it have a charge of zero? Yeah? Four it's got four electrons. There. And you've just discovered atomic theory. When objects lose electrons or gain electrons, then they become charged. We call them ions. That's going to be in the next unit. But yeah, nine protons plus, plus Mr. Duick, nine electrons equals, coming back to Jimmy, I think this was your number. What's nine protons plus nine electrons? As a number, please. I've got, got to cut, you know, come down on you like that. And we would call that neutral. Okay? What are we working on for the remainder of class? I have two things. So look up. Have a seat, Gabe, for a second. I've given you two things. Uh, I think I told you, uh, and if not, I'll repeat to you. Uh, for most chapters, if there's vocabulary-ish stuff, I'll put together a little crossword, and I will not... Sorry, I'll say this. Every vocabulary test word that's on your test shows up somewhere in the crossword, although I probably added more words. Okay, so the crossword might have 30 words, and I'm only going to ask you 15 of them or something like that. Uh, I photocopied this one. I shrunk it down because I figured you'd rather have the clues and the crossword in front of you on the same page instead of having to flip it over all the time. So I wrote here, uh, Jimmy, can you read this to me? What does it say? Just highlighted right there. Uh, the day of test. When's your test? Monday. Monday. So you can hand it in Friday if you want, but if you want to hang on to this, that's fine too, okay? Uh, second handout that I gave you is a little study guide. I want to give you some blatant test hints as well. So the study guide here has some questions and some notes. So vocabulary words to know, everything from the crossword puzzle, okay? You should know the basics from science eight of kinetic molecular theory. So you should know these ideas here. I'll probably turn these into some multiple choice questions. I might even turn this into a little bit of a written question. I might give you an example and say, hey, a situation, we're removing heat from an object. Tell me, is it going to go from a solid to a gas or, from, or, or solid to a liquid or liquid to a solid or whatever? Then I'm absolutely going to give you this picture, which is from page 21 in your textbook, and I'm going to ask you to fill in the words that go there. This is the one where we said you already probably know three of the words. You probably already know evaporation, condensation, and melting. Probably, assuming. It's the other ones you kind of got to figure out. Uh, sublimation, solidification, and deposition. Okay, so Phil, put those words in. And then I have some multiple choice -y questions you can answer. Some matching. And then some written questions here. Okay, I did attach the answers as well. This as well can be due the day of the test, but if you want to get it done now, you can as well. You have the remainder of class to work on these.